And for tonight, uh, speaking of great historians, uh, we have with us Gary Edelman. He is a graduate of Michigan State University and Shippensburg University uh, of Pennsylvania. He is an award-winning author, co-author, editor of over 20 books and 50 Civil War articles. He's the vice president of the Center for Civil War Photography and has been a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg for 25 years. He has conceived and drafted the text for wayside exhibits at 10 battlefields and uh, has given talks all across the country and also uh, appeared as a consultant and a, a talking head on Emmy award-winning shows. So without, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, the screen over to our guest tonight. All right, thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. I hope I am audible. Um, wave your hands if I'm not, because somebody asked if I was gonna give this at half speed or normal speed. And the answer is normal speed. Uh, uh, I recognize a lot of you all uh, out uh, in the audience there, but uh, for those who don't know me, I do speak rather quickly, happily. I'm, I'm seeing that this is being recorded. Um, so you will eventually be able to see this on the American Civil War Museum's uh, uh, YouTube channel. So here's my goal. Uh, we're going to just start talking about Gettysburg myths and mistakes. We'll stray from that a little bit. I am going to anger some of you. It's just part of the uh, <laughs> nature of talking about myths and mistakes and whatnot. And my real goal here, more than anything, is to help us collectively to be able to separate fact from fiction. Okay, And hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. So, you know, I, I have put together 40 or 50 things I want to talk about. Uh, you know, this could be a three or four or 12 hour or 20 hour talk, but I thought I'd start with some of the most pervasive myths themselves. And that is, of course, shoes, the Gettysburg battle, July 1863, this huge Civil War battle starts over shoes. But yet nobody sort of wrote about this for 14 years after the Battle of Gettysburg. You would have think this would have come up and you would think that the official records that actually show the armies coming to Gettysburg, not because of shoes, but because of the road hub. It's tough to pass through that part of Pennsylvania without coming through Gettysburg. Another uh, Gettysburg uh, myth, uh, you know, of course, is that that you're seeing in the picture here, and that is Spangler Spring. Uh, Spangler Spring is rumored to be this place. It didn't look like that during the battle. It was more of like a water hole, you know, bubbling up among some leaves and whatnot. This was, uh, you know, later walled in, but it was said that the Union and Confederate soldiers forgot their differences and fraternized among the cool, pellucid waters of Spangler Spring. Uh, and that's just not the case, but there are shreds of truth in every myth, of course. We do know that both Confederate and Union soldiers used the spring during the battle. We even know that at, at at least three occasions, there were Union and Confederate soldiers together at the same time. But in all of those cases, Whoever was writing about it said, we realized we were among the enemy. Like they said, who are you boys with? Oh, the 35th, 35th what? And then they realized they were among the enemy and got on out of there. So um, we have a, a lot of myths and mistakes at Gettysburg that you know are part of um, a larger sort of set of truths sometimes as well. Um, let's see, why isn't my thing advancing here? That's kind of interesting. Uh, there we go. So. Um, I want to talk about some of the mistakes, really, on just July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Uh, we can barely even, you know, you know, cover all this. But, you know, even on July 1st, you have, I'll pick a couple from each day, you know, you have the Confederates on Oak Hill, famously, in this huge attack with 30,000 Southerners or getting around the ends of 20,000 Union soldiers. One of the attacks, uh, and the most costly one for the Confederates in terms of percentage, was done by a brigade under the command of a guy named Iverson. Uh, you know, by all means, this is a mistake. He doesn't send his skirmishers forward. He doesn't move forward with his men. And at the brigade level, he probably should have. But there's a myth associated with that as well. Just because he didn't go forward with his men, does that mean he was cowering behind a log, drinking somewhere in the background? Uh, Iverson's pits would actually become subject to, you know, uh, uh, another myth of Gettysburg that we might talk about a little bit later. Another thing on July 1st, a little bit further, more toward the Union right or the Confederate left, is when the Union is reinforced. The First Corps is already there. The Union 11th Corps shows up under O.O. Howard, uh, or some people like to call him O.O. Uh Howard. Um, you know, 
the union advanced out to a uh, prominence called Barlow's or Blocker's Knoll. Um, by any account, this was not a good position to take up. Um, you know, so I would call that a definite mistake. Now, the myth comes in where we all blame Howard because he's a, an easy guy to blame. Look what just happened to him at Chancellorsville before. Look, he got flanked at Manassas. He got overrun um, at the Battle of Antietam as well. This must be his fault. I'm not so sure that's the case. I've seen some strong evidence really that uh, you know Barlow seems to have gone out to Barlow's Knoll uh, that now bears his name of his own volition. So you know sometimes we have myth and mistake sort of you know grouped together. Now on July 2nd, I'll point out a couple of others. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the counter march. This is when uh, the Confederate Army, namely Longstreet's Corps, is trying to get around sort of so they can threaten the Union left. They're marching behind Seminary Ridge. Um, of course, when they find that they're going to be seen by the Union Army, uh, you know, they sort of turn around and they don't just turn around, they sort of backtrack. They waste hours of daylight on a very important day for them definitely a mistake and even worse. Um, what they did was not follow their artillery that managed to get over to the Confederate right um, you know, without being seen. So there were tracks in the grass there. I don't know why Longstreet's men didn't follow. We might never know that. And if I'm getting too deep for some of you all, don't worry. Uh, we're not going to go into deep Gettysburg um, on this, but I'll bet you most of you know what I'm talking about when I mention the countermarch. Another thing on July 2nd, one of the most famous moves at Gettysburg is, of course, on July 2nd, when Union General Dan Sickles moves his corps forward. I mean, uh, you know, he is going to live longer than any of the other corps commanders at Gettysburg. And when you live that long and no one's there to argue with you anymore, you know, you make a pretty compelling argument. He says he saved the Union Army by moving out to the Peach Orchard. But I don't know how you could cl classify moving ahead, disconnecting from any, anything else protecting you, abandoning the, the powerful hills um, to your rear, and then getting pushed back to the point where your core will cease to exist several months later. That has to be a mistake wound up with all sorts of myth as well. Um, and then on July 3rd, of course, when you have pickets charged, where do I start? Um, you know, who was first over the wall? Was anybody over the wall? Who got farther? Uh, who ordered what? How much did Longstreet try to get Alexander to, you know, uh, actually make it? Uh, did the Union have anything to do with it? Uh, that is just full of all sorts of uh, myth. But, you know, considering how it worked out, mistake? Absolutely. Uh, did the Confederates have another better option? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Did the Confederates have a reason to think it would succeed? Aha, yes. The day before on July 2nd, you had just a couple thousand Georgians, along with help on their right, crossing that same field and, and, and getting to the Union position. Why couldn't six times as many Confederates do it the next day? As George Pickett may have said, I think the Union Army had something to do with it. And finally, uh, the final mistake I'll go into on July 3rd would be that of a feudal charge by a guy named Farnsworth, cavalryman, ordered there um, by Judson Kilpatrick um, to basically do a cavalry charge against infantry, uh, often not a good idea, um, and he would pay for it with his life and with the lives of a, lo a lot of his soldiers as well. So. That is just, as you saw, quickly going through just a couple of the mistakes or myths from July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. And there's just so many more. You know, I would talk about this sort of mix of myth when people look and figure the whole Civil War was fought in the East and it was really won in the East. This has been driving people crazy since during the Civil War. Um, look how little really what we call the East is. And I think you, uh, you all, some of you know that I like to have fun with this. Uh, somehow, if you go South and East from the East, you're still in the West, which is pretty weird to me. Um, so this is a uh, sort of a contrivance, but you know, Abraham Lincoln watched as the Union piled up, you know, 100,000 square miles of conquered territory around this vicinity over here. And then, you know, hey, that's great. And then Robert E. Lee sort of wins a couple of fights on the Virginia Peninsula. And it's as if that never happened. Lincoln couldn't figure it out. And people today just go and talk to some rangers at Wilson's Creek or Chickamauga, you know, or at Stones River to see if they're not still frustrated with the attention that the East gets. And if, if anything in the East is going to get attention, it's going to be Gettysburg. And I would suggest that it's probably because it is the largest battle. Now you probably have some Fredericksburg people out there saying, no, wait, there are probably more unions, there are probably more soldiers at Fredericksburg, but in terms of fighting, I think people engaged has to go to Gettysburg, certainly has the most casualties. And then it's right near the big population centers. It was photographed right after the battle. It's the first really Civil War battlefield to be preserved and you got the Gettysburg address. So these five or so things came together to make Gettysburg sort of this 
mecca that people like me like to call it. Some of you might argue with me about that. And I'll look forward to answering as many questions as I can in the end that you put in the chats here. Um, let's see, it's really interesting that my, my forward button isn't working as quickly as I'd like, but it's important, I think you all know that the photographers, as I mentioned, came to Gettysburg, several, I think eight different photographers came to Gettysburg um, within the months after uh, the Battle of Gettysburg alone. And you know they're gonna record all these photos. Uh, Alexander Gardner and his crew are the only ones to get there before the dead are actually buried. And here you have one of the more famous corpses of the Civil War, if I may. This is the dead sharpshooter before he was moved to the famous photo that you might know him a little bit better for, okay? Uh, William Frazanito outlines all this in his books. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about here. This guy, this, this Southern soldier was dragged 72 yards up to the perfect position here. A great 3D photo opportunity. And for 99 years, nobody knew, uh, had really figured out that that was the same soldier that he'd actually been moved and staged there for a photo. Now, just because photographers moved a body certainly does not mean that they're moving bodies all around everywhere. I've run into people all the time who say, oh, I guess photographers always drag bodies. No, this is the one instance we know about. A couple other people are trying to say somebody was dragged a foot or something like that. This is the only one. Is it appropriate? I don't think so. Did they do it all the time? I also don't think so. Now, this also gets into one of the more complex things when it comes to Gettysburg photography, and that is identifying people. Some time ago, uh, you know, during even not long after the Civil War, a woman said, oh, my God, that's my son. But um, her son was in a unit that was nowhere. I mean, miles away um, from there. And it couldn't be him. Uh, one of my battlefield guide friends at Gettysburg, I'm a guide at Gettysburg. Uh, he identifies this Texan on the left. Hey, maybe that's the same guy. Kind of looks like him, right? Uh, someone in Civil War Times Illustrated not, or Civil War Times not long ago identified this guy, a Georgian, as maybe it. People are really tough, okay? But I'll say that when people find someone that sort of looks like somebody that ends up in a picture, they become instantly convinced and nothing can uh, tell them otherwise. So if one of you all think that that's the dead sharpshooter or that's the dead sharpshooter, um, that's okay. I'm not going to argue with you, but I would argue with you on this one. Uh, I would call it among the most, this is a snippet of it, most famous photos of the entire Civil War. Um, of course, the three Confederate prisoners at Gettysburg, in part thanks to uh, Shelby Foote, who talked about it on the Ken Burns uh, series. Of course, you know, people have been trying to identify these guys for a long time. I've heard of some very interesting ways that people like to try to sort of uh, get into that particular, how do we know, who are they, why are they at Gettysburg two weeks after the battle? Um, but uh, about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, somebody managed to convince the United States Post Office that this somebody's and that his ancestors were in the photo. And unfortunately, the post office just believed it. They issued the stamp. Uh, unfortunately, there's a father-son combination that was supposedly in there, which these guys just aren't that separate in age. Um, one of them was known to be dead. One was known to be wounded. And it just all falls apart. So I would encourage you in my main goal of trying to get you to separate fact from fiction is to be careful when you reach conclusions about anything. Don't be easily convinced about your historical uh, you know, tidbits that you come across. A lot of this information is easily accessible and it just takes a little bit of common sense too. Um, of course, there are lots of Gettysburg photo mysteries. Uh, we're looking for where the 50th Pennsylvania and the legendary, literally, civilian John Burns were photographed at Gettysburg. There's some photos of the dead we're still looking for, but none um, have uh, really taken more hours of more historians and enthusiasts than this set. It's called The Harvest of Death. This photo accompanied by another photo here. And in total, they took five photos of these same corpses at Gettysburg. They are federal soldiers, and therefore, because this is a northern battlefield and, uh, and, and the north you know, stayed on this battlefield, they buried their own first, and therefore, these are thought to be the earliest photos um, ever taken uh, after the battle at Gettysburg, yet nobody's been able to find them. William Frazanito looked for a long time, and at least 35 or 40 different theories have come up to where these photos are located. Man, I've given whole shows on this for 40 minutes. So I won't go any further than this, but just know that there's a lot of people out there looking for it. And I hope someone finds this location someday. It's certainly there. Uh, you know, it's not like Gettysburg has been obliterated from the earth if in fact it's at Gettysburg. So I'll move on from there. I will say that those photos, as well as all the other photos I just showed, um, as well as most of the photos of the Civil War were taken on these things. You see a glass 
plate right there. It's the wet plate photographic process. So that's a four by 10 inch plate, uh, incredibly high resolution and whatnot. And one of the things that uh, popular media has done for us is that they told us that these glass plates were later sadly put into greenhouses and they were all burned away by the sun. Oh my word, if only we still had all these glass plate negatives of Robert E. Lee um, at, at his Richmond home, at US Grant at Cold Harbor, of the dead sharpshooter, maybe we could learn some more. Oh wait, that's a complete myth. Um, the idea that these precious Civil War negatives burned up in the nation's greenhouses, this is an art installation I'm showing you here, is demonstrably false. And I say that because we have catalogs from the Civil War and you can compare those catalogs to the wet plate, the glass plate negatives, mainly at the Library of Congress and the National Archives. Of the 10,000 documentary images thought to have been taken, not portraits, I'm talking about the documentary images, um, almost all of them are still in those facilities. Some are at the Smithsonian Institution as well. So, so we, that's a complete myth and it drives me nuts. Now, were greenhouses made out of wet plate glass? Absolutely. People failed to pick up their uh, glass plate portraits from studios and the portraits, you know, the photographic artists would just sell them you know, to uh, glass companies who would then make greenhouses out of them. So shred of truth in every myth again. Um, here we are on top of Little Round Top, and uh, you see a battlefield guide here. The guides have been officially around for about 115 years, but even before that, there were these hack drivers and guides that would take people around the battlefield. And man, luckily, a lot of their stories made it into uh, books, and some of these books and newspapers just tell us what we call old guide stories. We have so many of them. Um, here's one showing, of course, Little Round Top on the left and Big Round Top on the right. Um, but a woman wrote in once and said, no, 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 everybody's wrong about this idea that Little Round Top is called Little Round Top because of its proximity to the bigger hill, Big Round Top. Rather, she says, Little Round Top is named for her great grandfather, Peter Little, the same man after whom Littlestown is named. And of course, my friend Tim Smith and I, ever since we read that, have been scouring the records looking for the big family after whom Big Round Top is named. Come on. Um, this also leads me to one of my favorite stories, actually, um, because a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, old guide stories can do have shreds of truth. But I think the most ridiculous one I ever heard was about uh, in this very area near the Valley of Death, you're going to have uh, 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 Union soldiers and Confederate soldiers all there crying for water. And one man whose legs had been blown off found a man whose arms had been blown off. And the man with two legs Got, uh, took onto his back the guy with two arms and together they went and got water. Come on. I mean, uh, I guess people would believe these because these old guides kept telling these stories and whatnot. Um, you know, one of my favorites, uh, you know, is this, uh, you know, with 150 pounds of iron and lead estimated to have been shot at Gettysburg for each person killed there, 8,000, 10,000, um, it's possible some bullets met in midair. It's almost impossible to think that they didn't at some point. But one guy went to Gettysburg, I think it was in the 1880s or something like that, and went back home uh, having bought in a store the rarest of the rare, a specimen of two bullets that had met in midair. And he went over to his friend's house all excited and said, look what I got, probably the only one around. And the friend said, hold on for a second. And he went into his back room and came back out and produced the same thing, a very similar bullet that had met in midair. And he said, hey, where'd you buy that? He's like, in Gettysburg, what store? And they quickly found that they had bought it at the same shop. They went back to Gettysburg together, uh, accosted the man, broke into his shop, broke into his back room and found two guns set up with a timer on tripods where he was making these bullets that were meeting in midair. They busted up his machinery and left. I don't know if they roughed him up at all, but uh, the guy probably deserved it. When you're talking about mini balls, my favorite story is this. Um, of course, some of you may have seen this in the old courthouse museum in Vicksburg. And that is of course, you know, that. It, it, it can't be myth because what obviously happens here is a woman did not have sex out of wedlock and get pregnant. What obviously happened is she was safe in her home practicing excellent morals when you know a bullet from nearby somehow passed through a man, through his testicles, carrying matter with it through his clothes, then through her clothes and into her ovary and impregnated her. So I guess that was, must be what happened, not that maybe she had sex out of wedlock. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, supposedly that's the mini ball there about the mini ball pregnancy. I'll let you all decide what you believe in that. Um, let's see. So real quick, uh, a story I tell on my tours at Gettysburg a lot is about a North Carolina soldier um, who supposedly got shot through the lungs on the first day at Gettysburg. He uh, 
survived that wound. It is a survivable wound, not especially comfortable. And he was said to have breathing trouble for the next several years until something like five years after the Battle of Gettysburg, he had a terrible coughing fit and coughed up a five by seven inch piece of his uniform that had been driven into his lungs during the Battle of Gettysburg. He said he took a photo of it and that his breathing trouble went away. Now, I've ended up with a lot of surgeons on my tours over time. They all tell me it's totally impossible. Um, of course, doctors are always trying to diagnose Civil War people today. And we do have another account from Gettysburg, actually, of a Wisconsin soldier, I believe, um, who did, and thanks to Chris White for this photo here, um, you know, who actually supposedly coughed this up 18 weeks after. Now, tiny pieces of cloth 18 weeks after the battle and a five by seven inch piece years after the battle might be two different things. Uh, I'll let you decide on those as well. Um, and speaking of Wisconsin soldiers, this, this must be Wisconsin soldiers because the, the one on the right is wearing a hardy hat, okay? And as we know, you know, only the Iron Brigade had hardy hats during the Civil War, right? Of course not. Um, that's not the case. Uh, uh, the Iron Brigade might be well known for wearing hardy hats. That's the uh, taller one on the right there. Um, but a lot of other people wore them, including one of these guys here, uh, probably of the 150th New York, which used to be an Eastern Regiment, actually, but not in the Iron Brigade. Um, and by the way, this detail uh, taken at Atlanta is maybe one of my favorite close-ups of the entire Civil War. Check those guys out. Now, right behind them, looking in the other direction, you can actually see another Hardy hat here, and it has a 150 on it actually there. Uh, if it's not blocked by your uh, tab at the top, you might be able to see another Hardy hat over there. So people in Atlanta after Atlanta surrendered are wearing Hardy hat as, hats as well. I'm trying to address here the broad brush that we have. You see another one potentially in the lower left there. We tend to think that one thing applies to the entire Civil War. And speaking of that, we hear about, you know, the shoeless Confederate, shoeless Confederate all the time, but here's a Union soldier um, that you can see is barefoot. You can see his foot actually between beneath the trail. And because I want to creep you out, I'm actually going to show you a nice close up uh, shoes. You know, they didn't necessarily have comfortable shoes at the time. I'm just going to let you gaze at that for a while. Maybe he just took his shoe off because they're uncomfortable. Um, and if he was shoeless, does that mean his whole unit is shoeless? Does that mean the entire Union army at that uh, uh, Atlanta issueless, of course not. So we like to take single examples of things and take them just a little bit farther. Uh, we're, we're pretty actually, uh, you know, good at doing things like that. Um, and these guys here, uh, you know, holding some Spencer repeating carbines. Oh man, there's going to be someone out here who's going to hit me because if you ever say anything about a gun on Facebook, there is somebody there to tell you how wrong you are about which gun you said. Oh no, wait, the lock plate says that it's something different. In any case, I want to straighten this out here, if I may, because at the Battle of Gettysburg, you have Buford's cavalry supposedly slowing down the Confederates for a while. And how were they able to do it? Oh, my God, all of them had repeating rifles. So just real quick, in the Civil War, most guns the infantrymen carried, of course, were muzzle loaders. Eventually, of course, they're going to have carbines, shorter ones that cavalrymen could use that you could fight, load from the back. They're breech loaders, OK? Something being a breech loader allows you to fire faster, but it doesn't necessarily make it a repeater. People have a way of saying, oh, Buford had some Sharps carbines. Oh, he's got repeaters. That's the same thing as a Spencer or a Henry. No, a muzzle loader and a breech loader does not necessarily to speak to whether it is a repeater. So um, I just thought I would bring that up because you've got this sort of myth that Buford is you know, armed with all these repeating rifles. Now the Confederates felt it. One of them said they could load on Sunday and fire all week. Um, and you've got this here addressing what is must be the most pervasive myth of Gettysburg nowadays. This is a photo I took at the Parthenon in 1989. OK, now at that time, how naive I was, I thought you can see the sun coming through it on the right over there. And, um, you know, back then I thought that was called sun coming into my camera. But little did I know that uh, several thousand miles away in America, these ghosted Gettysburg books were coming out here. And suddenly I realized that this was not sun, but rather these were orbs, OK, and that those are light rods sneaking through there. I used to get water on my camera. And then, you know, I thought it was water on my camera, but now those are all orbs and everything like that. And the ghost craze, at least for those of you who follow Gettysburg and some of the other historic sites, are just absolutely crazy. People lose their minds trying to perpetuate this myth now. Don't go away with me saying there's no such thing as ghosts. I don't know if there is or isn't, but the Gettysburg ghost stories are absolutely made up. They're made up to make money. Um, I've been there. I've watched them be made up before. And I think my favorite one 
is uh, about the triangular field at Gettysburg. Supposedly, A, your pictures won't come out in the triangular field, mine always have. Um, and uh, supposedly, if you take a rock from the triangular field, uh, you'll have bad luck, okay? So what do people do? So that ends up in a book. So people read the book, they take a rock and blame their misery on the rock and run right back to the publisher. Oh, please return this rock to the triangular field. You know what? If you blame your misery on that rock, you deserve it anyway. You took federal property away from the battlefield and you were told it was bad luck. So excuse me, as a devil's den guy, I get a little bit worked up with the ghost stories and seeing things like this in the newspaper, um, you know, here and there. Uh, of course, every ghost at Gettysburg has, has to do with the battle. It can't have to do with the 200 years plus that people have been living there and existing and, and being humans, of course. Now, myth also you know, really pertains to our historical figures. James Longstreet, forever associated with Gettysburg and so many other battles, is here on the left. What do you think of when you think of Longstreet? You might think of him after the war, but during the war, People think of him as one thing, and that is a defensive fighter. Oh, he's great on the defense. That's interesting. You know, he was nominally in charge of Pickett's Charge. And if you could say he wasn't really that interested in that, you could say, well, he was also mostly in charge of the larger attack the day before, the second day at Gettysburg. OK, well, I wonder how you could explain that Pickett's Charge is just a little warm up exercise for the 30,000 soldiers he led into battle at the Battle of the Wilderness. Um, how about the 30,000 he had already um, done in a charge at Second Manassas. What about the 20,000 at, uh, attacking uh, with him at the Battle of Chickamauga, the most fortuitous attack of the Civil War, in my opinion, pouring through a huge gap in the Union line. Longstreet is good on the defense, but he launches a powerful offensive blow. It's just important to keep in mind before you say, hey, Longstreet's you know, a defensive guy. Look at his whole Civil War career. That, that is not the case when you really look at it. And John Bellhood. Oh man, what a great fighter, what a great division commander. But you know what, once he moved up a little bit higher around Atlanta and especially around Spring Hill, Franklin and Nashville, he just lost his mind. It must be because he's on drugs. He must have been on laudanum there, even though there's no real evidence that he ever took it more than once, okay? So we, as historians, as enthusiasts, we like to look for reasons, that, you know, things that make sense. How can we explain Hood's missing the Union Army at Spring, at Spring Hill. I think there's a great book about that if you read For Cause and For Country, um, The Battle of Spring Hill, co-written by, uh, and uh, Franklin, written by uh, Eric Jacobson. Um, you know, I'm not in favor of what he does, but I don't want to make anything up uh, to say that he's a laudanum addict of some sort. And then Robert E. Lee. You know, I, I won't even touch this too far because Lee is just invincible. He's great. Well, you know what? Uh, he didn't win all the time, you know, uh, to be sure. And one thing you got to say about him, too, is that the dude wore black so white socks with black shoes, and he's got little baby feet also. So that's the second foot picture I'm going to linger on there for you. Um, but he is also supposedly really known, oh, what a gentleman. He didn't even call the enemy the enemy. Um, he, he's just, what, what a man, you know. And by the way, I'm a huge uh, Lee fan. What a dangerous opponent for real, but we have to call out these myths where people construct these things later. And this one really bugs me because in a major media event, it is, uh, he never called them the enemy. He always said those people, oh yeah, let's, let's look at his Gettysburg report. Okay, here's his July 4th report. I guess, you know, this must be a mistake. It must be an anomaly that he used the word enemy five times in one long paragraph. Let's look at another Gettysburg report. Oh, he seems to be moving up to six times on that page. Ooh, oh my God, he really likes using the word enemy, it turns out. I don't understand how this myth could be so wrong. Uh, I think he's gonna top out somewhere at 10 on one page. Um, and then there's this one, most people aren't even familiar how much really he just liked to use that, sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so this took me about three minutes looking on the official records online at Ohio State University. And um, you could see that he says enemy all the time, you know, yet we all think that he just only called them those people. Um, you know, and as for Gettysburg, let, let's dish it out to some more Union soldiers here, uh, or Union people here. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, here's the Gettysburg Address. You know what? I don't see the back of an envelope. I thought he finished writing the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope on the way to Gettysburg. No, we know that he wrote it in the White House. We know that he finished it at, in Gettysburg in his room. We have the papers he wrote it on. So there's no need to come up with any sort of a myth, um, really, about uh, uh, you know, uh, how he wrote it on the way to Gettysburg. And by the way, it turns out that, you know, you're looking for him at Gettysburg in any picture, and there he is, right? Because that's a guy with a top hat. That must be Abraham Lincoln. You know what? 
Somebody's saying, this is Lincoln. He's wearing a top hat. That must be Lincoln too. Oh my God, look how many Lincolns there are actually at Gettysburg in this fictitious version, of course. The only one that's not wearing the top hat is Lincoln himself right there. So it's just crazy. I go on eBay and I see 1872 pictures saying, this is Abraham Lincoln. Give me $100,000 because the guy's wearing a top hat. I mean, even if you're not wearing a top hat, if you're just standing in front of a pole that makes it look like you're wearing a top hat, somehow you're Abraham Lincoln. Um, you know, if you're in Fort Sumter, even right before, <laughs> you know, right after the war started, you are Confederate politicians, future Confederate soldiers, you must all be Lincoln as well. And this stuff drives me crazy. There's a top hat, it must be Lincoln. And, it, you know, although Jackson wasn't at Gettysburg, of course, he's always the discussion. If the, the most common what if a battlefield guide gets at Gettysburg is what if Jackson was here? Um, and all the guides have some pretty snide comments on uh, you know, what, what it would have been like if he was there, namely what he would have been smelled like because he'd been dead for two months already by then. But he's very well known in his pictures, um, you know, especially artworks for wearing this forage cap you see here. And man, uh, uh, this hits me again really hard because there's his forage cap there and therefore everyone with a forage cap has also become Stonewall Jackson. Even Union soldiers are Stonewall Jackson. Um, and then this guy, I mean, people have been trying to pass this photo off at Stonewall Jackson with no more evidence and the fact that he's wearing um, a, a forage cap and that he has a beard, okay? Uh, you know, and, and really you can just point out, I, I like to find imitation Jacksons all over the place because it's pretty easy. Another thing that drives battlefield guides at Gettysburg just mad is this myth of the horse's hoofs, okay? You're looking at a photo here, you can barely see him, but I believe that's William Howard Taft in the back of the car and the Gettysburg National Military Park's first and only early commissioner, John P. Nicholson here at uh, Union General John Fulton Reynolds' equestrian statue. And um, that statue, um, it, it has two hoofs up in the air. And the myth goes basically that uh, if you have no hoofs in the air on your equestrian statue, you were not wounded. If you have one hoof up, you were wounded. If you have two hoofs up, you were killed um, in that battle. Of course, four hoofs up supposedly means Robert E. Lee. Um, but, you know, this is an absolute myth. This people tell in, in DC and in Rome and in London, Guides tell people that this is true, but the sculptors are on record saying, no, I did not intend to do this. So it's just a myth. And it happily doesn't work at Gettysburg anymore since the 1990s, since the James Longstreet Monument came around. Now, I can't really say too much uh, about this, but uh, here is a line of battle. And I'm just showing it to, show, to, to try to convince you, of course, of the thing. I don't think that you would fall uh, prey to this particular thing, but uh, you know, people can't help but think that they were that they're smarter than people in the Civil War. If only you were around back then, you'd be able to tell people, oh, I have a much better way to fight. Oh, I have a much better use of medicine. I have a better way for you to conduct your government, okay? And I wouldn't just go at people this way. And you know what? The Civil War, um, consisting of people who had the same cares, hopes, and dreams that you do, failed to produce some magical way to get into people's fortifications. You know? So, you know, uh, you know, I just try to always stress that we're not smarter than people in the Civil War. Now, after the Civil War, of course, um, you know, Gettysburg became such a popular place and people really dissected everything about it, including which walls were built when. Um, unfortunately, the War Department put up this plaque here saying that this wall was built for defense on July 3rd. Unfortunately, they put it at the wrong wall. There's another wall right near it. Uh, both of those, one of those walls was built after the fighting was over and another one was built some 15 years um, afterward. Um, and, you know, and that really led, you know, sort of Little Round Top, the obsession with Little Round Top really created a huge myth, um, one that I love to talk about, how in 1863 people said Little Round Top was a little bit important or didn't talk about it at all. Ten years later, it's the key to the Union left. Within 40 years, it's, you know, not all the cannons on earth could batter it down. Uh, loss of Little Round Top would have equaled the loss in, of the experiment in American democracy. And it's really just crazy what people have said about Little Round Top. Uh, the Confederates could have captured it, turned the cannons on the Union Army, uh, you know, repelled all the reinforcements that were on the way, captured the Tawny Town Road and all sorts of ridiculous things. But when you start looking at it, Little Round Top, you know, um, was really more important, you know, for the Union to retain than it was for the Confederates to have it. Um, and I go into that in a lot of videos that you can find on Gettysburg Daily and elsewhere, if anybody would like more information about that. But what I'll say is that when you started getting into Little Round Top, you know, it became so popular. We're going to talk about the Ken Burns series, I think, shortly, and Killer Angels and whatnot. 
I mean, there's a quote in the Ken Burns series where um, William C. Oates supposedly says, within 10 minutes, I could convert a little round top into a Gibraltar that I could hold against 10 times the number of men I have. Fine, the quote is real, except that the word little was never in the quote. It said I could convert round top. And anybody who knows Gettysburg knows that the name for big round top for many years was just round top. Therefore, you know, was this little added to have it make more sense? Has the fame of little round top obliterated big round top entirely? Um, you know, and I think you can make a good argument that that is just the case. Of course, after the Ken Burns series came around, then the Killer Angels had really gained popularity with the release of the Gettysburg movie, um, which really placed um, the whole story of Gettysburg around, you know, six soldiers and a British spy. Um, and that really placed um, an undue emphasis upon certain action. The fight for Little Round Top became the most important fight. And therefore, its victor became, you know, to many people that come to Gettysburg, he's the commander of the Union Army at Gettysburg. Um, so again, I know you know this already, this group. Um, you know, but uh, we should be able to separate, you know, a novel, you know, from actual um, historical events. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm winding up a little bit here, or at least starting to. Sorry, everything up to this point was one sentence, so I need a drink here. Many of you for, are familiar with this particular monument here. This is to Albert Wilson, the last surviving, um, you know, Civil War veteran. But aha! I wonder about that because this guy on the left, a guy named John Salling actually, uh, when he died in, uh, I think the spring of 1959, that made the guy on the right. Well, um, Walter uh, Williams, I believe is his name. I do have some notes here, but I think most of you know, I don't really use notes, um, but I think his name is Walter Washington Williams. Um, and that made him the last surviving Civil War veteran. Wait, Albert Wilson only died, already died in 1850, 1956. So I guess these guys are the oldest, no. People started questioning and whatnot, and uh, a newspaper man eventually looked around and found that uh, um, this gentleman, uh, I think it is Walter Williams actually, um, that he had actually lied in his census. Uh, early on, uh, his birth date was right around the time of the Civil War, not long before it. Sometime in the 1920s, he took on his dad's name and he started checking the box only at that time in the sentence, census and in the associated uh, paperwork that he was actually a veteran. Why? He and so many other soldiers actually started checking that box so they could get pensions during the Depression. And we found that after he was dead then, that uh, or, or discredited, that John Salling was the last uh, surviving one. No, same thing with him. Same thing with this guy on the left, Lundy. Same thing with this guy on the right, Riddle. Um, and you can check them off, eight more people, um, all of whom claim to be the last surviving veteran um, of the Civil War. All of them have been discredited. There was even a... Uh, African-American man named Mac McGee, who in the 1970s said 134 years ago, I was born and I was helping to dig uh, both for the Union and for the Confederacy as a slave. It, found, it was found that he took on his father's name as well. And therefore, um, indeed, uh, Alfred Albert Wilson, who you see here at about 105, 106 years old, is the last surviving Civil War veteran. He died in 1956. The last surviving Confederate seems to be Pleasant Crump, who died in 1951. I'd be curious to know if anybody in the chat, if anybody ever met Civil War veterans. I only missed the last one by 11 years. It's certainly possible that some of you have. And in that sense, the Civil War just wasn't that long ago that I've met more than 100 people who shook the hand of Civil War veterans just blows me away. Um, now, tying this up sort of here uh, is, is a picture here. This is a generic picture, but you can see the gentleman on the left um, you know, is missing his right leg. And one man said that he used to go around uh, saying that he lost his leg at Gettysburg, even though he didn't, because he could get food you know, during hard times. And this guy actually was walking down um, a highway somewhere in Ohio, and he found a pleasant woman. And she said, how'd you lose that leg? And she said, he said, at Gettysburg. She's like, oh, well, come on in. My husband was at Gettysburg. Um, he'll, uh, he'll come out of the barn and talk to you. So the guy sat, sat at the table. The father comes in and says, oh, uh, where were you at Gettysburg? He's like, I was in the cemetery. He's like, oh, uh, my son, uh, Bill, he actually fought in the cemetery. And Bill comes out and says, oh, did you hide behind any sort of a stone? He's like, yeah, it was a sort of a Scottish stone. And he said, oh my God, my brother Bob actually was behind a Scottish stone. Let me bring him out. He's like, I was behind the only stone there. And I don't know you, sir. And he's just, what, what unit were you in? And he's like 35th Ohio. And he's like, oh my God, my brother Jim was in the 35th. Let me go get him. And uh, Jim comes out and says, you're a liar. 
I've never seen you before in my life. And he said, oh, I didn't say 35th, I said 25th. He's like, oh, good. My brother Aaron was in the 25th Ohio. And the brother Aaron came out, said, you're a bald faced liar, missing leg or not. And he dragged him outside, pitched him over the fence. And what did this veteran who had lied about his wound say? He said, I just determined it was easier to say you got drunk one night and went in front of a locomotive than to lie about it and say you lost it in battle. So some myths and mistakes are actually corrected such as this one. The idea of building a casino at Gettysburg happily um, has been fought back so far. Then this one um, was, of course, uh, reversed uh, in uh, the beginning of this century, of course. A beautiful moment, I think. Um, and then I think the biggest myth in, uh, I run across and what I'll close on is that surely somebody would, would have preserved the mecca of all Civil War places, right? Why didn't they do it? Well, the fact is, is that preservation, I work for the American Battlefield Trust, I think a lot of you all know, um, you know, is, is, does not just happen. The US government doesn't do it. So in 1863, four acres were preserved. 30 some years later, it was only 600 acres. Uh, you know, go another 50 years, it was 2,500 and so on. Um, by the time of World War II, Korea and Vietnam, the federal government had gotten out of the business of land preservation happily. Um, the movie Glory, the Ken Burns series, the 125th anniversary of the Civil War, a lot of things conspired to renew interest in the Civil War and to sort of create the modern battlefield preservation movement. Um, as for what the trust has been able to do, um, you know, and this is even four years old now or five years old now, but more than 32 deals at Gettysburg, about a thousand of the 8,000 acres preserved at Gettysburg have been preserved by the members and support as the American Battlefield Trust um, at a great cost. So, um, you know, but we've of course preserved a lot more around Richmond, I'll say to this group here. Um, one of the things that we did, I think you all might remember is General Lee's headquarters at Gettysburg. Uh, many of you watched as we not only got the land, but slowly took down um, the hotel buildings, the 40 hotel buildings and the putt-putt golf course and the um, swimming pool and everything, and finally returned it and unveiled it. Um, you know, we opened up a whole new part of the battlefield, thanks to our members. And um, what I'll say here is that a lot of people wanted to go into the house, but a lot of people were really just concerned about, um, you know, in the old photo that they can see, a little slipshod two-bit backbeat bargain basement doghouse next to the house. And people were obsessed with that. And um, I was uh, you know, absolutely determined to get them to build a really bad doghouse next to the real one. And so we did, except they built it too nice. So uh, I've always asked people to beat up on this thing and kick it. Don't steal it, but give it a nice kick whenever you go. And that is my final request from you um, today, other than um, asking you and thanking you for supporting battlefield preservation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Gary. That was excellent. And um, I know you wanted to deal with questions in the chat, so uh, have at yeah. it. Okay, I'm, I'm scrolling through them now, believe it or not. Uh, uh, could you say something controversial about the private observation tower of 1970? Well, I, I did cover that, so I'm glad. I love it when I see the questions and then I find that I already uh, uh, covered it. So did Chamberlain save the known universe at Little Round Top? Uh, uh, that's a pretty funny one. One thing I do want to say, though, is that, you know, Chamberlain's on the flank, right? Oh, my God, what an important position. There are like 15 different Union left flanks on July 2nd alone. It's near the wheat field. It's near the Weikert Farm. It's on, it's at Devil's Den. Then it's at Little Round Top. Then it's at Big Round Top. Then it's on Wright Avenue. Then it's on Howe Avenue. Uh, so it is pretty interesting. What I'll say about Chamberlain is, of course, that uh, the dude lived and he could write really well. Uh, you can't say that about any of the three commanders, four commanders next to him, all of whom were dead within a year. Um, so who's going to tell the story of Little Round Top and who's going to change his story about Little Round Top from time to time? Uh, somebody likes the horse's hoofs thing that I debunked. Any uh, opinions about the lost Lincoln photo? Uh, it depends which one you mean. Um, that We used to talk about a lost Lincoln photo in terms of the um, Lincoln uh, in lying in state photo, uh, of course, that was found in the 1950s. So we have him in his coffin, actually. Uh, there have been so many lost Lincoln photos and people love to sue other people about um, all this. I think what you might be talking about is the one on the Discovery Channel not long ago where somebody, again, found a guy with a beard and on a pillow and a postmortem and just constructed a thing that makes no sense, at least to me, um, how that could possibly be Lincoln. So if that's the one you're talking about, I give it a hearty no, a very hearty no. Uh, somebody's talking about the Peter Principle, that must be uh, about John Bell Hood. Um, I think uh, somebody's saying, of course, Lee used the term enemy in his reports. He was an efficient soldier. So 
He's so maybe what I me taking him down for using enemy in his reports at all uh, that maybe he only used it conversationally. It would be interesting to see actually somebody look at the rem reminiscences of people and see if you can come up with quotes where he used enemy in conversation. I'll bet that you'll come up with plenty of those examples. I especially have issues with superlatives. He never called them the enemy. Well, of course that's not the case. Um, Lee had a major weakness. He didn't learn from his mistakes. I'm not going to get into that. I, I'm trying to read these while staying away from controversial stuff. I don't want to talk about it at the same time. Um, so let's see. Please address the story about the soldier who cut off his own leg after getting shot on or near Barlow's Knoll. Um, there is no myth there at all. This is Samuel Wilkinson, of course. I'm sorry, Samuel Wilkinson's son, um, Bayard Wilkinson. This is a sad one, of course. He um, is in command of a battery there. Um, and he is desperately wounded. He is um, eventually dragged to the almshouse, the sort of poorhouse of Gettysburg, which is right behind Blocker's Knoll at the time. And he apparently finished finished the uh, you know amputation of his leg with a penknife. Now, um, I've heard people question that, but what we do know is that his father, then a correspondent at the time, came upon his son's body and left behind one of the most moving quotes that I won't try to do in full, only to say. Um, that he said, how can I write the story of a great battle when my eye is immovably fixed upon the central figure, the dead body of an eldest son put into a battle where he should have never been put and left to die in a hospital where surgeons dare not go. Um, that's what I'll say about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Longstreet and Thomas had a lot in common. Good. I like that. Uh, I'm trying to make fun of, aren't these made up? I'm 39 years old and saw a soldier walking that disappeared into the field. Good. I'm not telling you that there's no such thing as ghosts. I'm glad. Um, the ones that I see, when I see a news crew take the battery out of their camera and say, go into the triangular field, walk out, put the battery back in and say, when we were just in the field, our camera didn't work. Or when I've seen a battlefield guide make up a story about a woman named Paulina Noel, um, who got killed uh, after the Civil War uh, by a carriage and was angry about it. So that night with a fiery finger of hell carved her initials um, in the rock and we all laughed about it. And it was in a book four months later. Um, you know, I remember when you used to be able to Google Spangler Spring and Spangler Spring, the place came up and all the history about it. You know, for a while, it was like the second, third, fifth, eighth, ninth, 10th and 12th, you know, uh, 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 result on Google. Uh, I've, one time I was out at Spangler Spring at night and I was behind a monument, I wasn't hiding and I stuck my arm out and a car screeched to a halt, said they just saw a ghost. It could have been a person behind the monument. If you smell tobacco, that person could be 400 yards away smoking a cigar or something. So all I'll ask, don't, don't, don't listen to me when it talks about the existence of ghosts or what you see. Just use your minds and, and that'll satisfy me. Um, uh, I'm glad uh, uh, to hear that we're carrying on on your father's legacy, Pam. Um, uh, any idea why it took so long for Alonzo Cushion to get the Medal of Honor? Um, I do know that the Medal of Honor, um, you know, is often something about currying favor, having boosters doing this for you, you know, um, and whatnot. Uh, Cushing uh, just didn't get it. His family tried for decades. Uh, I can't say why it didn't happen in the 1970s as opposed to, I think, 2006, um, if, if, if I have that right, 2016, I'm sorry. Um, I can't really answer that one, Sarah. Let's see what else we have. And um, Kelly, I'll ask you, by my watch, it looks like we still have seven or eight minutes, so I'll just keep moving. Um, Let's see. Oh, ooh, here we go. Can you discuss the myth of General Sickles and his leg? Okay. The myth, of course, is, or the story is, that Dan Sickles, terribly wounded. The shell didn't land near him. It struck him square in the leg, ripped off his leg, so it's just dangling by some skin, supposedly. And then, coolly smoking a cigar, being carried off the field, he instructed his staff to complete the amputation of that leg and bathe that leg in alcohol so they could save it. The only myth part of that really is that he probably wasn't carried off the field coolly smoking his cigar, um, but he did instruct for the um, um, preservation of that leg. They reconstructed the bones, put it down in what was the Army Medical Museum, and I always botched the name of the modern um, facility where it is. And it is also known that he supposedly, I just contradicted myself, he supposedly took friends to visit that leg for the remaining years of his life. And yet somehow he got off in part on temporary insanity. Um, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect there. Uh, let's see, uh, General Lee was quite pol polite in language indeed. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Lee was a consummate gentleman. I wasn't trying to take anything away from him. Uh, we want a photo extravaganza. John Bell, that was in part a photo extravaganza. And uh, 
Um, I give them all the time. There are some on YouTube. I've done at least 15 different ones at least 150 times. Um, you're welcome. Uh, let's see, I can't quite read your whole name, so I won't try to say it beyond Stokes. Uh, let's see, who's the most underrated officer at Gettysburg? Uh, this isn't about myth or mistake or anything. Um, you know, let's think about this. I'm tempted just to stir the pot and say Oliver Otis Howard because everybody hates him and thinks he's a complete failure and that's just not the case. However, that's not actually how I feel. So who is really underrated? I'm going to go with uh, the likes of Henry Benning, the only one to keep his brigade together around the terrible fighting around Devil's Den. Um, I'm going to go ahead with, uh, I think that one of the 11th Corps um, guys, let me go instead, instead of with uh, Krasniewski, let me go with Schimmelfinnig. Those brigades fought like crazy. And I think they are greatly um, underestimated. I'll also go with maybe, uh, you know, Abner Perrin, who's South Carolinian, stormed around the seminary and got to the town square probably first. I think he doesn't get quite enough due. So I'll stop there because I'll end up naming half the brigade commanders at Gettysburg and talk about it. Um, some years ago, there's a book called The Last Confederate uh, Widow. I'm not going to get much into that. All I know is that about 25 years ago, the last uh, Civil War pensioner or Confederate widow died. Uh, within a year, they said, oh, no, we found another one. And then that woman died. And they said, oh, no, we found another one. And then the last one just died again. So we'll see um, if we have another one uh, coming up. Let's see. Do you think it's fair that Longstreet gets all the blame for Pickett's Charge? No. I mean, I think the, the fish thinks from the head. I firmly believe that in almost all things. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Robert E. Lee should have and does take responsibility. Nobody really blamed Longstreet for everything so much until after Lee was dead. And then they started criticizing Lee as well. So, um, and I would recommend, even if I got some of the timing wrong, um, read Lee and Longstreet at Gettysburg or Lee and Longstreet at High Tide by Glenn Tucker. Excellent treatment of their relationship at Gettysburg. And it is a hugely underrated book to understand more about that relationship at Gettysburg. Let's see, will this be a video I can see in the next couple of weeks? Yes, um, or next couple of months. I don't know how quickly it'll go up, but Kelly tells me it will be up on the American Civil War Museum's YouTube channel, and we'll encourage you to share that with your friends. And uh, I know at the speed that I talk, it is good to have these things on video, and I like to watch them later too. Um, let's see, it looks like some of you are arguing among yourselves. Thank you, National Museum of Health and Medicine is the name I always uh, watch. I appreciate that, Marsha. Can you talk to my school about Gettysburg myths and how much you would charge? No, uh, my life has changed a lot. I am the chief historian at the American Battlefield Trust. And I just really can't do many groups anymore. Zoom did make it easy for me to accept this one six months ago, but I'm already pretty much booked up for 2021. Um, and I just don't have time anymore, which is a shame because I love, if you can't tell, I love talking about this stuff. But I need to um, spend a lot of my time uh, helping to preserve battlefields and educating people about the Civil War and the land we're trying to save. So I cannot do school groups anymore, but we do have hundreds of videos that you can show in your room. Um, and I would recommend that. And we're actually starting to make virtual field trips. By the way, I, I run uh, with my team all of our educational efforts. So look for virtual field trips. We have crash courses. We have free curricula for all you teachers out there. I hope you're already using our stuff. Um, I've heard that uh, Lee was still affected by the loss of Stonewall at Gettysburg. Absolutely. Um, here's somebody who had to change his whole army around because he had nobody to replace Stonewall Jackson. And I don't know if there's anybody here who would say, you know what? You know, by the way, and Stonewall was not perfect uh, by no means. He, he did not win all the time by any means. But, you know, could you really say that A.P. Hill and Richard Ewell on a consistent basis really were the likes of the heyday of the Army of Northern Virginia under Longstreet and, uh, excuse me, and Jackson? OK, now a lot had also changed. The Confederate Middle Command, the brigade, brigadiers and colonels are starting to die off by the middle of the war, too, so that, you know, Hill, Ewell, Jubal Early and, you know, Richard Anderson, you know, they might not have as fair of a shake. I'm not sure if they have the full flower of the Confederacy the way that, uh, you know, Longstreet and Jackson were able to enjoy it. But by all accounts, I strongly believe that uh, Lee was still feeling Stonewall's absence. And I think he said, I know not how to replace him. And I think that was true. Any thoughts on the accuracy and mythology of the cyclorama? Uh, I strongly recommend um, if you ever get the chance to go on the evening with the painting, where you have the painting to yourself. Um, uh, and I strong, and, and if you can get Sue Boardman or Chris Brenneman explaining all that while you're there, excellent. And then if you could get their book uh, about the Gettysburg Cyclorama, printed by two different publishers, the most recent of which is Sabbath Beatty. Um, and I think it's an excellent book that deals with it. My take is trying to show one point in time on any painting or any, or any map, it's impossible to 
I think it does a very good job. I do think it has some mythology associated with it. They also throw in the artists and Abraham Lincoln and all sorts of other things in there and some poppy fields from, you know, Europe in there at the same time. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's as far as I'll take it. And I think I only have time for one more. Let me see if I can find a good one here. Please talk about Schimmelfinnig hiding in a pig pen. Um, of course, Schimmelfinnig is a union brigadier general and the guy I bring up, whose name I bring up, uh, you know, when I talk about, you know, how the 11th Corps is really just, you know, tarnished as being the Flying Dutchman, and they've got these commanders like Shriznuski or Krizniewski, or, and there's 20 different pronunciations from that. Um, listen to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, by the way, with my friends, uh, Jim Hessler and uh, Eric Lindblade, if you want to get into that, if you're podcast people too, and they know somebody who went over to Poland right to where Kritz was from, and supposedly know how to pronounce it, so check that out. Um, so Schimmelfinnig, uh, unlike so many of his comrades in the 11th Corps who were captured in the chaotic retreat through town, actually found a very small hog shed um, and was able to hide in it as the Confederate, as the Union Army rolled past him and the Confederate Army came and occupied the town. And luckily, um, a woman in town, a girl, was able to bring uh, uh, food out to him. And after the Confederates left, he stretched his legs, came out, and unfortunately only lived a few more months. So I've always considered that a sad story. And since this is, we are talking about war here, I'm gonna end on that one. And um, thank you all, uh, you know, for all your questions and for watching and coming out tonight and everything you do to support all this, uh, this great history with which we're all obsessed. So thanks for having me, Kelly. Well, thank you, Gary, so much. And I apologize, I think I completely left out that you were chief historian for American uh, <laughs> Battlefield Trust in my uh, haste to get you uh, get you going and kind of cut your introduction. But um, that was excellent. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, so sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning of this, but I think we survived. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, continue well from here on out. But do keep in mind uh, our next History Happy Hour on February 8th and sign up for the symposium. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And Gary, I'm going to let you do the honors and um, hit uh, the end of the meeting because my keypad is still not 100% correct working. <laughs> I am extremely honored. And I'm even going to warn you that I'm going to do it in mid-sentence. Like there's going to be no...